I, I wanted to well, welcome back, please, to the stage, Mazia Bahari. And I also want to have join the conversation someone who has been living in the region, uh, not the filmmaker, but uh, a curator uh, who I've known for a few short years and seen in different international fora, including this one at Itfa and Sunny Side of the Docks in Thessaloniki, uh, a wonderful man, uh, Orwa Nariyapi. As a film festival uh, curator, so um, it's hard to really know where to begin with this. It just there's so many kind of things that spring out of uh, the last few scenes. Don't eat those flowers. I saw a funny picture of these two guys I had taken for the Itfa Daily. You were up on behind some fence, but it did look like you were behind bars once again, but the difference was that you were both smiling, so I know this is not going to be a, a laugh fest, but uh, I think there are some attitudes perhaps we could get at, at that might include, uh, the, I heard the word joke there in the last, uh, it's, some of this stuff is pretty absurd, especially the charges that are laid against uh, people, I don't know, perhaps as your, your thesis, as you are, describes uh, an end time for this kind of uh, forced confession. I don't know what your reactions are to your own film you're seeing it in the world premiere and uh, and also the, also to the Syrian work. Well, uh, it's a funny coincidence that uh, an hour before the international premiere of this film, this film was shown on BBC Persian television just and night, I think, right? Just like, yeah, one hour at 6.30 Amsterdam time and millions of Iranians watched the film as well. And the conservative newspapers, they've already started to insult me, saying that the BBC is afraid of the, our intelligence uh, strategies and they are, you know, insulting me, telling me that, uh, saying that I'm a Zionist agent. And, it's just so sad. I mean, when, whenever I see uh, this film, and I mean, during the editing, one thing that really saddens me, and I, when I was watching the Syrian film as well, it's just that so sad to see the waste of energy, to see the waste of intelligence and humanity going into these stupid, ignorant uh, interrogations and suppression. Because these people who are my interrogators, or the people who you see in Orwell's film, who are beating people, they are human beings. And in a better society, they could be productive members of the society. They could be engineers, they could be construction workers, doctors, you know, they wouldn't be prime ministers and, you know, presidents, but they could be productive. And it's just that it's waste of energy and humanity that really, really bothers me and disturbs me. First, congratulations for the film. It is really, really, really not my film. <laughs> this is not a bluff. It is not my film. Okay. It was made by two wonderful uh, filmmakers in Syria, two beautiful, wonderful women, and uh, I'm happy that you saw it because I know it's, uh, of course, you are the very first people in the world to see this thing, to meet uh, the singer in the film, the wonderful woman, who uh, instead, I mean, she managed until the film was made not to be uh, detained, so she was not forced to go on television. She chose to go in such a film, but of course with the limitation of uh, keeping her identity uh, hidden or unrecognizable. I hope you enjoyed it, but then I don't know how to go on. Peter, it's your turn. <laughs> it's hard to defend it if you haven't made it, but uh, I do think it's like, uh, uh, I really, when I saw it, well, that's a rough version of that a couple of months ago. I did think there was a sense of hope in it, a, a kind of a young woman, a kind of, I think, a poet. A, 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 the way that culture is this kind of the soft, 
power, the soft tool against the overthrow of these kinds of regimes and remind people that there, were, there are 80 other dictatorships that we could have played films about and, and uh, similar techniques and then not only in the contemporary world but historically it's not a new invention. It's forced television conveyed that can, are but you know Stalin had his movie cameras going in the short trials as well. I, I, but I do, I do find a kind of sense of hope in the, in the poetics of, of response whether that's music or filmmaking, in fact, is, and, and, and you uh, as a, um, the threat to the Western world or the representative of the most evil uh, Western media, or however they label you, label you, are also a kind of documentary information artist. Yeah, I think that the best way to fight dictatorships for a filmmaker or an artist is to make films and create arts. And for a uh, regime, a dictatorship, an authoritarian regime, the a real weapon of mass destruction is art and culture. And in both films that we see what separates uh, people who are being suppressed and interrogated and their interrogators is culture. In case of Orwa's, uh, the film that Orwa produced is this woman's poetry and music. And in the case of my film, of course, when Farage uh, is after mock execution, he goes into this imaginary world that you know he sees Beethoven, and I'm sure his interrogator doesn't have any idea who Beethoven is. And you know, this is like this is what I experienced as well. That you know, when you have culture, when you have uh, cultural enrichment, you can always surround yourself within that inner universe of yourself. Of course, there is external pressure, but then there is something that you can keep intact within you, and that's culture. And I think, I mean, uh, whenever, uh, before going to prison, whenever I saw the cultural cuts, I mean, we get political here, that whenever I see that the conservative governments, when they go through austerity measures, the first thing that they cut is culture. And it bothered me in the past, but now it really angers me because if you don't have culture in a country, it's just that you lose the soul of the country and the soul of the nation. And I think in both uh, our films shows how important a culture is in a dictatorship. And I think in the free world, it's the same thing. I, I certainly agree. And then I think that the the past two years in Syria have made it very clear to, to, to the Syrian society how important art and culture is. It's something that was very new, a uh, big surprise to all of us, whether we worked in arts and culture or not. Uh, I, I think, for example, I always wrote before the revolution about how the Syrian society was always so afraid of the camera always hating to see a camera and hiding from, away from it and hating the person who comes with a camera because there's obviously something we were kind of ashamed of. Maybe we were trying to hide something most of the time. Suddenly, since the very beginning of the revolution, a camera person is always celebrated wherever, almost wherever they go. Uh, people carry many more cameras around. Everybody wants to film and then Photography, music, as you saw in the film, uh, musicians, writers, uh, and comedy. We are enjoying a huge amount of comedy. Of course, it's, it doesn't really fit the picture because uh, to international media, it's only uh, convenient to show blood and small YouTube videos which are really scary and bombing and slaughtering and so on. But what we live in Syria includes that, of course, that's not a lie, but includes so much more, which is about dancing, singing, laughter, real comedy. It's a very rich experience that we're, we're, we're experiencing today in Syria. And the world, the, the society is exploring all of the potential of uh, art in this sense. That's very new. And I think that's what uh, really bothers dictatorships and authoritarian regimes to, uh, about culture. Because culture, what it does is that whatever it is, film or music or poetry or even journalism, is that it gives cohesion to people's desires and demands and voices. 
But also what it does is that it creates a cohesive image of the atrocities that are committed by the dictatorships and uh, authoritarian regimes. So the regimes thrive on these individuals who don't know the consequences of their actions. For example, my torturer or the people who are tortured in uh, Syria, they see their individual acts and they don't think about their consequences. But when we as filmmakers and other artists create this cohesive image and show it to people, it is not only the people who like us watch it, it is also the torturers and interrogators and the children who are watching it. And that is uh, something that really is scary for these regimes because they cannot uh, tolerate the fact that there is a cohesive mirror in front of the regime and its uh, atrocities. I love that symbol, cohesive, a cohesive mirror. Uh, or while you were running the Dog Box uh, uh, Festival for a number of years, and uh, um, what the images, we have another Syrian film that's um, here, uh, that's made by uh, Yara Lee, that's shot really on the Turkish uh, Syrian border with uh, people who managed to escape. Uh, she's not Syrian, obviously, but well intentioned, she's from South Korea and, and Brazil, actually. but. Um, uh, there's a couple of other Iranian films here that have managed to be made, but um, I'm just wondering uh, we see embedded journalists or that sneak back into Syria and report back out, but I'm just wondering what the state of affairs is of filmmakers uh, there. How are they surviving? Just like anybody else, they're all very hardly surviving. <coughs> it's not really survival. Uh, for some time, there was it was possible inside Syria to commute or to move between different cities or, or areas and today it is not possible actually. It's much easier to go into the uh, three parts of Syria from Turkey and then within the different uh, opposition groups you will be allowed better uh, mobility than inside the Syria under Assad majority of, of Syria. Uh, so many people now are forced to stay home actually and they barely leave their uh, apartments. So the possibility of making film in a real, uh, you know, free uh, sense is very difficult unless you are in, in the free parts or the liberated parts of the country. But some, some wonderful young men and women are in the free parts of Syria now. Uh, they are under a lot of pressure, under a lot of uh, danger. Um, we hear, you know, from them and we hear about their injuries every other day. One of them gets a mortar grenade nearby exploding or a tank shelling, sometimes a fighter jet uh, missile. Uh, many of them uh, are injured or, you know, really uh, in, in, uh, under siege and some of them, of course, uh, were killed were killed uh, by regime uh, fire. Uh, th this doesn't mean that I'm going back to the uh, dark side of things. Because again, uh, I'm sure that even the ones who died were enjoying something they never enjoyed in their lives. We heard some, you know, many people in Syria say that yes, it's worth it, no matter what the risk is, because what we're feeling today is so different from anything we felt in our lifetime. Um, and then, of course, I have to, uh, you know, to tell you that watching forced confessions takes me, of course, back to what's happening in Syria and what's been happening in a parallel reality since the 80s, of course. Uh, it's amazing how similar these oppressive regimes are. It's amazing how since the 80s there was the same tactics in a way and then how regimes who used the same tactics became friends all of a sudden and then they you know walked along the way happy together and uh, today of course it's it's uh, close to the end of al-Assad's regime but the Iranian regime is still there and uh, it is it is I believe a very important alarm to the entire globe to say that it doesn't need until you know a dictator is bombing its people with uh, fighter jets before we have to discover that we should do something and of course I mean mentioning fighter jets this is 
always my most painful example in the past month that um, civilian areas in Syria are being bombed by Syrian Air Force fighter jets uh, with, in, 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 a, in a precedent, historical precedent. I don't think this ever happened in humanity's history. Uh, but still, it's kind of banalized in the news all around the world. Everybody looks at that as if it's normal, as if it's ah, bored of the blood. I think something has to be done to stop this. But also, I can continue in what Orwell was saying. What I try to emphasize in the film is the international pressure on dictatorships because all dictatorships, even North Korea, which is the most isolated uh, dictatorship that we know, they want to be legitimate. They want to be internationally legitimate. And many of you in the audience signed petitions for me and Orwa, and I think by showing the petitions for Farage and Siamak and others in the film, I wanted to show that every signature counts, every Facebook click counts. And you know, you may think that, again, your individual act is not going anywhere, but collectively, it really grabs the attention of dictatorships. And the simple example for that is the presence of both of us on this stage because of your signatures and your uh, Facebook clicks. So it's very important to be aware, to very important to pressurize and disgrace the regimes for what they are doing uh, to their own people, especially to their artists. For those who may not know, uh, you were incarcerated for 122 days in an Iranian prison, and, or uh, more recently for 22 days in uh, Syria, and it was through uh, campaigns really organized by film communities and a lot uh, that helped, uh, yeah, as you say, allow you to be here. There's so much to talk about, I really want to get the microphone over there. I mean, I, I also maybe, I don't know if you want to talk about your incarcerations, or I think we'll just get to the public, and I'd like to maybe end up talking about the role of new technologies uh, uh, towards the end. But please, we have two microphones somewhere. Uh, there's a hand up back there. I don't know if there's anybody to run a microphone up there. Away on the other side. Yeah. Can we get a microphone? Because we'd like to record the questions as well. I heard that there was a, there's there's one. a official from the Iranian government in Amsterdam. I was wondering if he is in the audience or not. If he is, I would love to. I don't mean, know. I'm not joking. I'd really love to hear from uh, the Iranian official. I got jealous. Any Syrian informers in the room, please identify yourself. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for your film. Um, in your film, you showed a few generations of uh, Iranian prisoners who were forced to make confessions. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could elaborate on the impact of this short rise on uh, public opinion and on Iranian people who watched uh, those trials uh, through the television? Well, uh, as we say in the film, in the beginning of the revolution, it had the effect of um, showing the power of the regime and also proving to the followers of the regime that these people are traitors, treacherous, uh, and spies, and some people believed it, but gradually it uh, lost its power. These days, the Iranian uh, government is not only internationally isolated, but it's also internally isolated, because like any other dictatorship, you know, you have a group of people who try to create a, a utopia, but then they create a utopia for themselves, and they have to uh, um, protect that utopia within the country. So uh, the Iranian government, in terms of films and this forced confession, is becoming like uh, some modern artist that you know they create art for their small group of audience, and then they like each other's works, they applaud each other, and then you know they create each other. So, I mean, they are worse behaved than the modern artists, but the case is that they're isolated and they are they don't have that much effect on the masses of people anymore. These days, I mean, I was really surprised because 
you know, I thought that people were going to chastise me and criticize me for uh, saying that the Western media is bad, etc. But really, no one said anything, and people were just saying that it was a stupid show, and you have to do what you have to do. There's a great line I like the, uh, in your film when uh, you say, I, I think, uh, when the uh, dictatorship stops believing the lies that it's been generating, then you know it's almost over. So. Yeah, it's just that uh, I think we were talking of, uh, before uh, the screening with Orba that, you know, the interrogators and the dictatorships, what they have in common is just this stupidity and ignorance. Like Orba's, uh, one of Orba's petitions was signed by Robert De Niro, and his interrogator asked him, How, "What is your relationship with Robert De Niro?" Because the guy didn't know what was his, who is Robert De Niro. And in my case, I was a member of two fan books, and one of them was Anton Chekhov. And my interrogator was telling me that Chekhov was a Zionist agent, and you know. He was putting, uh, was trying to incriminate me through Chekhov, who was not a Jewish, and he was actually a bit of an anti-Semite. And you know, it's just that this ignorance and this uh, these dictatorships they thrive in this ignorant uh, atmosphere. And as soon as you inform people, as soon as you give people information, as soon as you give people images, you give people words, and then you give people agency. That is when, uh, that's the end of the dictatorship. And that's when they realize that, oh, maybe we should have given people something, but that's too late. You know, it's just too late. More questions, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. My name is Pia Hornquist, I'm a Swedish filmmaker, and I'm one of those who signed to get you out, Orva, from the prison. Uh, you want to speak about what happened there, or, or I mean, <laughs> No, no, I mean, we were many, but I mean, we were so, I mean, I was in Syria just before this all started, and, and it was such a relief that when you get out that it meant something, that, I mean, that also our signature meant something, because of course we were told by people that it doesn't matter whatever you do, nothing will, I mean, it will mean nothing. Uh, uh, Mr. Dolmikus, of course, thank you for, uh, for many other things that you have done, not only for signing. Uh, I have to say that, yes, I am very sure that the international pressure worked very well. I have uh, always been defending an idea that was mentioned beautifully in Maziar's film, silence never got anybody out of prison. Uh, and uh, But there has always been debate internationally and in Syria and in Iran, and many people were always thinking like maybe we tease them too much if we talk about the detainee, maybe we should just keep silent, not to uh, provoke them. I think it is always needed that we speak about the person. In my case, it was uh, quite a surprise to the, to the regime or to its intelligence because they, uh, they did not expect that I am not a politician. Was that an explosion? <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we, the, I was presented in all the petitions as a uh, filmmaker only. Nobody mentioned anything, nobody discussed me as a politician or as an activist, and that was very active, very effective. It resulted directly in them being kind of, you know, asking themselves, are we dealing with the right person or not? And by that, the level of torture I was subjected to was you know, a little less uh, violent than others around. Uh, it is, it, it, it's, it's, in my opinion, a great example. Here we are, both of us. I think we should do this every day. I think it should, it should become just like an exercise for all humans around the world. We wake up in the morning and see, did some dictator detain somebody? Let's say something about it. I think this should be just like having your morning apple or, you know, thinking of any uh, bio foods. This should be you your sport. You have apples in the morning? No, only in the hotel, yeah. They keep putting apples in front of the food. <laughs> well, I think uh, what uh, really, I think what you can uh, imagine is that these uh, dictatorships, they're like a dark room. 
And by signing petitions, Facebook clicks, you're just cracking in the walls of dark rooms. You're creating cracks so some light can go through. And that's good for the prisoners, but also it's good for the prospective prisoners, people who are in line to be imprisoned in the future, because they are gaining the strength from your signatures and Facebook petitions right now. So I think you should just not only think about now, you should think about the future as well. Uh, other questions, please? So one way at the back, if you can wait for a second to find them. Maybe we'll make an exception. I'll pass the question down, and we will hear it. It wasn't actually a, a question. Just um, following up on your um, your uh, what you just said about getting the word out about people being um, in prison. Um, uh, Balman Gomadi's brother has been arrested, and he put out um, a call today for people to start um, protesting about this. And I'm writing a petition. Yeah, yeah. Batman uh, had an interview last night with the International Campaign for Human Rights in Iran. And his brother is was arrested yesterday, so we don't know what are the circumstances, but it most probably has to do with Batman's activities. We don't know yet, but uh, what uh, one thing that Batman knows and everyone else knows is that you don't have to be silent and. The worst thing for a prisoner is to think that he or she is anonymous. And unfortunately, there are many anonymous prisoners in remote areas in Iran, and I'm sure there are thousands of them in Syria, and they are not lucky like Orba and I to have the audience here that, you know, who can somehow manage to pronounce our names. You know, they have, uh, they, they, you don't know their names. I don't know their names. And that is the worst thing that can happen for a prisoner in a dictatorship. And, and I really think that there's no necessity of making sure why he is arrested. Let's defend him first, and then we will see. If we were wrong, then we are just human, and we can be wrong. But it's better to be wrong defending somebody than being wrong forgetting about them. And also, I think you just have to ask why is he arrested? Why the regime is not announcing? You know, if he's uh, done something wrong, then they should come up with the information. I mean, they cannot just go around and arrest people, incarcerate people, torture people without any. But they have to defend themselves. Yeah. They are the ones who took somebody's freedom, yeah, they and they to, have they to have defend to, themselves yeah. and convince us. You have to make them accountable. That's the most important. And in this sense, it's just like, you know, being always a little skeptic is, is turning into a big, big disease that we all are having all around the world. Like, let's wait and see. The same thing is happening to Syria now. The same thing happened to Iran before. Now it just feels for a Syrian, frankly, as if somebody is standing in the West and saying, well, maybe those guys dying, those children dying, they might become Islamist when they grow up. So let's wait. The missile is going down, and we can just keep asking such questions in a very uh, irresponsible way. And uh, actually, this way, I don't think we will get anywhere. We need to be proactive in this sense altogether. I really believe that the existence of the Iranian regime, as much as the Syrian regime or the Saudi regime or many others, is really harming the existence of Dutch people as much as Brazilians. It is one world. It's not a, that's not a myth. We are living in one world and it will travel. This pain will travel. Travel via diaspora, via immigrants, or travel directly with political uh, turmoil. I don't know how, but it is coming if we don't stop it together. I'm um, very eloquent. You, you've also both written very eloquently uh, about your experiences in being incarcerated. I bought your book in South Africa, in an in a airport in South Africa. So it's, uh, your story has become very widespread. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it was a big book, and I had a 12-hour flight back to Amsterdam, and I, I didn't read it all, and I left the book in the 
thing in the airplane, so I hope I can get another copy from you. Uh, but I would really highly recommend what I've read I saw so far. I saw and reading the book. So <laughs> uh, I'll give you a book. I would uh, really recommend the first half of the book. <laughs> and, and, and any more uh, questions? Maybe you could tell us a joke about that. It's in it circulating around Syria. And, you know, I mean, you said com I think satire and comedy really is a, 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 a very uh, effective tool against dictatorships. It's, it's really difficult to translate. Uh, to, okay. You know, political political satire. But then, I, I keep on remembering when when Maziar mentions the stupidity of uh, interrogators. Uh, I, I remember very well the this chief chief officer interrogator who was uh, complaining to me, saying, "Look how the human rights watch are lying all the time. They are saying that we torture people by hanging them from their feet to the ceiling and then leaving them for three days. Do we do that?" You tell me, you were here for two to three weeks, tell me, do we do that? So I looked at him and said, no sir, I'm sure I didn't see that. I only saw you hanging them from their hands to the ceiling for three days. He said, see, they are liars. <laughs> so, and it just becomes very normal, you know, that they hang people from their hands to the ceiling for three days. And that's that. And then he's happy that I proved to him that I made sure everybody knows it's not from the feet. I think... I think it's about time. Uh, I mean, there are creators uh, who really live and exist in dark situations, and as a result, like any other person or being uh, that grows in darkness, they have complexes. And from what I know from reading, because for this film I, I tried to do a historical documentary, I ended up just doing it about Iran. And I was reading about uh, Stalin uh, torturers, Czech torturers, Chilean, and all of them are obsessed with sex, as you see in my film, that, you know, it's sex is just sexual uh, uh, desires, it's suppressed sexual desires in these people really define them. And my torturer, you know, uh, what a lot of humor that came out of my experience, I mean, uh, post-prison, you know, as people say that, humor is pre imprisonment plus time. It's just, uh, it all came out of, it, most of it came out of uh, his sexual suppression. And, you know, uh, he was just fascinated with sex. First of all, he was going through all the names on my uh, email accounts, my phone, <laughs> with each woman, did you have sex with her? Did you have sex with her? And, you know, and, and he, he couldn't believe, and you know, he had a very twisted understanding of sexual behavior in the West. One of his famous questions was that, don't you think that I can just go to Champs-Élysées Street in Paris and grab someone's hand and have sex with her? I said, no, I think you will be arrested. And he was like, but my professor at university said that I can do that. I said, well, most probably he's lying, because I think that... <laughs> You can't get arrested, and he was like, "No, no, no." So, do you think? Do you say that everyone uh, on Champs Elysees walks with burqa and pray? I said, "Well, you know, there's a big difference between having burqa and pray and being ready for sex, you know." But you see that in pornos. I said, "Well, they are pornos. They're not documentary films." So it's just like he had this twisted version because he thought he was watching pornos. And he thought that these are documentaries that, you know, the milkman comes home and has sex with her, and the fireman comes home and says, like, oh, so all that I should be a fireman in Holland, and, you know, I can have sex with every housewife. You know, it's just that this is a twisted version. That's your humor for tonight. The docu-porn. The docu-porn film test. Uh, uh, just a final question. Uh, uh, maybe we uh, can take it. Yeah. Is that a hand or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody's got two hands. Which one is there? Oh, there you are. I see you. Okay. Yeah, the other one is cosmetic, so it doesn't count. Anyway, um, Mr. Bahari, thank you for the film. Uh, I know you're wrong here. I would like to say that we wish luck for all the Syrian people to see a free Syrian land. I, I really hope so. As an Iranian, I really hope that very soon we see a free Syrian country, free of Assad. I, I really hope 
that that would be a great beginning for the year. So let's do it now. <laughs> Um, uh, Mr. Bahari, my question is that uh, you were arrested by guards, revolutionary guards. Um, I was arrested by the Ministry of Intelligence in Iran. Uh, earlier this year, we had these young kids who were arrested by cyber police for uh, programming a water uh, guns war in a park in Tehran. And they were also brought into TV, as well as you and I. Do you uh, think that... Um, um, are the different parts of the regime acting the same way because they enjoy from the same um, benefits of doing this? Or is it just a coincidence? No, it's really, I think, one of the other problems with these dictatorships is that they have different parts and they really don't learn from each other's experience. As you know, uh, the Ministry of Intelligence in Iran, they've been doing this since the beginning of the revolution and some of their members are 50, 60 years old and they're really experts. So when they see the name Anton Chekhov, they just go to Google if they don't know him and you know they find out he's a Russian playwright so they don't ask about him. But with the intelligence, uh, the, with the uh, Revolutionary Guards Intelligence Unit, they are just learning how to torture and how to interrogate. So they are making the same mistakes that the Ministry of Intelligence was making 30 years ago. And as a result, there is this vicious circle of atrocity, ignorance, atrocity, ignorance, and I don't know how this can be broken. And in many other uh, dict dictatorships and in many other authoritarian regimes, I read about the same kind of experience that they just don't learn. That's the, that's the main problem from the uh, this, uh, dictatorships that they just don't learn. I mean, if Bashar al-Assad just studied his father and, you know, knew what were the problems with his father's uh, government, then he wouldn't make these mistakes. It's just that, but maybe that is in the nature of the dictatorships. Maybe they are dictatorships because they are making mistakes and they're ignorant. It's just, uh, you never know, it's just like, it's, but it's a vicious circle of ignorance and atrocity. I just wanted to uh, maybe ask one final wrap-up question because we have to get out of here. It's really about the, the role of NGOs like the HEVOS and the Amnesty and the Human Rights Watch and the research groups, you know, and beyond the kind of popular uh, petition signers like our friend from Sweden and, and others who helped spring you guys, but um, on a kind of other level, what? How do you regard them, or how are they regarded? Uh, generally speaking, throughout our work, working culture, in a country like Syria, where the uh, regime was never interested in supporting independent culture, or art, or film, or festivals, or production, uh, the regime was never interested. So uh, we found a lot of uh, uh, support from European and international organizations such as EVOS, such as IMS in, in Denmark, such as a few other organizations. And what was so interesting, of course, is that they came to, to me in interrogation. So I was uh, actually interrogated about what are these strange people? Did they tell you to do this revolution in Syria? And then I was like, no, they didn't. They have a different job. They do differently. They try to support things and to raise awareness around the world. They have different agendas, which are only cultural and in terms of rights and so on. But it was very difficult for the paranoia of the regime to understand that it was not about a hidden political agenda. I think by, by today, we're getting rid of these mythologies about uh, hidden agendas of everybody, we know everybody will have some agenda and then we will know we'll just choose the better one. And uh, so, yes, I have to say that HEVOS and uh, many other organizations were quite central to the work of many organizations in, in Syria and also in Iran in many ways. Yeah, I have to agree with Orba, and uh, I think cultural enrichment, uh, whether it comes from Hebos or from Itva Fund or Chris Klaus Fund or 
you know, uh, from different international organizations, British Council, they are very important. And also, in terms of human rights groups such as Amnesty or Human Rights Watch, both, I mean, they do two uh, things that one of them is education and then advocacy. And unfortunately, I think there is not much uh, emphasis on education and there is a lot of uh, emphasis on advocacy. And I just hope that people become more aware of the educational work of Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or International Crisis Group and all these different organizations. But advocacy, of course, is very important and that's what uh, makes some changes. But I think uh, the most important thing is education. And one thing that I always tell foreign audiences, especially when I see Iranians and the people in the diaspora in uh, foreign countries, is that you live in a democracy. Your votes count. And when you ask me after the film, usually, what can I do for the people in Iran? I say that just put pressure on your own politicians, your own members of parliament, your own ministers, and tell them what you want to do in terms of their policies towards Iran, whether it is boycotting, whether it's sanctioning, whether it's a dialogue. You have the ability to know your MP. That person, your member of parliament, needs your vote to be in that position. And he or she really wants that position. So just use that power in order to make some change. Because people in our countries, we don't have that power. And that's why we are here. Well, um, as you are, uh, thank you for your film, and, or well, thank you for your film festival. And if you ever, if you ever discover the filmmakers, uh, pass on their uh, our thanks for all three of you um, um, shedding light really on a kind of dark uh, a darkness, and we do that through uh, the illumination of documentary porn.